The term rabbinic was applied to the Jewish literature of post-biblical times by those who conceived the Judaism of the later epoch to be something different from the Judaism of the Bible, something actually opposed to it. Such observers held that the Jewish nation ceased to exist with the moment when its political independence was destroyed. For them the Judaism of the later epoch has been a Judaism of the synagogue, the spokesmen of which have been the scholars, the rabbis. And what this phase of Judaism brought forth has been considered by them to be the product of the schools rather than the product of practical, pulsating life. Poetic phantasmagoria, frequently the vaporings of morbid visionaries, is the material out of which these scholars construct the theologic system of the rabbis and fairy tales, the spontaneous creations of the people, which take the form of sacred legend in Jewish literature, are denominated the scriptural exegesis of the rabbis and condemned incontinently as nugi rabbinorum. As the name of a man clings to him, so men cling to names. For the primitive savage, the name is part of the essence of a person or thing, and even in the more advanced stages of culture, judgments are not always formed in agreement with facts as they are, but rather according to the names by which they are called. The current estimate of rabbinic literature is a case in point. With the label rabbinic later, ages inherited from former ages a certain distorted view of the literature so designated. To this day, and even among scholars that approach its investigation with unprejudiced minds, their opinion prevails that it is purely a learned product. And yet the truth is that the most prominent feature of rabbinic literature is its popular character. The school and the home are not mutually opposed to each other in the conception of the Jews. They study in their homes, and they live in their schools. Likewise there is no distinct class of scholars among them, a class that withdraws itself from participation in the affairs of practical life. Even in the domain of the Holoka, the rabbis were not so much occupied with theoretic principles of law as with the concrete phenomena of daily existence. These they sought to grasp and shape. And what is true of the Holoka is true with greater emphasis of the Higoda, which is popular in the double sense of appealing to the people and being produced in the main by the people. To speak of the Higoda of the Tonim and Amorim is as far from fact as to speak of the legends of Shakespeare and Scott. The ancient authors and their modern brethren of the guild alike elaborate legendary material which they found at hand. It has been held by some that the Higoda contains no popular legends, that it is wholly a factitious, academic product. A cursory glance at the sodepigraphic literature of the Jews, which is older than the Higoda literature by several centuries, shows how untenable this view is. That the one literature should have drawn from the other is precluded by historical facts. At a very early time, the synagogue disavowed the sodepigraphic literature, which was the favorite reading matter of the sectaries and the Christians. Nevertheless, the inner relation between them is of the closest kind. The only essential difference is that the Midrashic form prevails in the Haggadah, and the paranetic or apocalyptic form in the Sudipigrapher. The common element must therefore depart from the Midrash on the one hand and from Parenesis on the other.